Alrighty, welcome to chapter 15, the last chapter of the semester. And today we're going to talk about the dynamic ocean, which includes all kinds of shoreline processes, the, how the waves form, where they form, and how they crash ashore, things like the tides and currents. And um, let's uh, get right into it. So the ocean, you think, is just this big body of water, right? But there are actually currents or like sort of rivers of ocean within the ocean that flow from one place to another. Sometimes they're warm currents, sometimes they're cold currents. They develop because of the friction between the ocean and the wind that blows across the surface. So if you have prevailing winds pushing water in a certain direction, you create sort of this river effect. Um, and these are really slow, they don't move very fast, but they are very noticeable, especially in some areas of the world, either for warm or for cold. Those are called gyres. There are five main gyres found throughout the world. The, the North Pacific and South Pacific gyres, the North, Pacific, North Atlantic and South Atlantic, and then the Indian Ocean gyre. And those are all related to the atmospheric circulation. So the prevailing winds are going to blow the ocean water in a specific direction and then carry with it either warm water or cold water, depending on the direction of origin. So here's a map of the ocean showing the main gyres. And you can see we've uh, we've heard of this one, right? The, the Gulf Stream here. This carries warm water up the east coast um, from the equatorial region. So that's a warm water uh, type of um, gyre. And then you have this cool, down here in South America, you have a cold one that goes right up the coast of, of uh, South America. That's a cold water gyre. And same thing down the coast of California. A lot of people think of, you know, the Pacific Ocean as being, you know, warm and stuff. And it is in many areas. But there are certain parts of, you know, uh, the ocean off the coast of California, Oregon, and Washington are actually quite cold. Um, because the just the, the nature of the way the water circulates, it's coming down from the north. Now, the ocean circulation is deflected by the Coriolis effect, and that's the effect of having a spinning body of like the Earth. So in, in, the, um, in the northern hemisphere, it kind of spins to the right, right? And then in the uh, southern hemisphere, it spins to the left. And those are the main currents that generally exist within each gyre. And you saw that in the previous slide. Now, what are the importance of these? Well. The importance of these is they dictate a lot of the climate that's going to take place, especially near the, the shore, but even inland as well. Currents from low latitudes into higher latitudes, warm currents, transfer heat from warmer to cooler areas. And then the opposite is true for the other direction. So the influence of cold currents is most pronounced in the tropics during the summer months at middle latitudes. So like, for example, in, off the coast of South America, you have cold water currents that in an equatorial region. So you can see the difference here. On the west coast of the uh, South America, you have a warm water trend here. And you can see that pretty much all year, it's still pretty warm. It dips down a little bit in what would be our summer, their winter, because they're in the summer, their hemisphere. But you can see off the coast of Peru here, the ocean temperature dips. It never gets nearly as warm, and then it dips really down into the 60s um, off the coast of uh, Peru here, because the water's coming up from colder areas. Uh, bringing with it the colder water. Now, water rises from deeper layers. And we talked about this in a previous chapter when it dealt with sort of the uh, the kinds of uh, animal life you're going to find. When you have that water, that cold water that comes up from the depth, you have typically along the West Coast, it brings concentrations of dissolved nutrients to the ocean surface which is typically where you're going to find a lot of biodiversity. You're going to find all kinds of cre creatures that thrive in these environments because there's lots to eat. And when there's lots to eat for the tiny little organisms, then it just moves its way up the food chain. So here's an image off the coast of South Africa, and you can see the chlorophyll concentration because it's being pushed up. You know, all the water 
is being pushed up and along with it all these nutrients that creates uh, chlorophyll at the surface. And that's it, just based on the circulation of the ocean, it's moving in this direction like this. So it's bringing sort of the cold water up with it. So what causes this deep ocean circulation? Well, typically it's a response to dif uh, differences in density. Now that could be one of two things. So you have a, di a difference in temperature, cold water is more dense. So if you have warm water that's on the surface and then it starts to cool off, it'll start to sink. Well, somewhere else something has to come up and as it comes up, it gets warmer and it creates sort of this secular pattern. And then the other option, the other uh, means of this is salinities. So if you have increasing salinity, the water gets slightly more dense, it sinks, gets colder, and somewhere else that the salinity is probably a little less and it kind of be becomes more buoyant, comes up to the surface. So it can be one or both, a combination of both temperature and salinity um, when it comes to these deep water circulations. When it is salinity as the primary factor, we call that a thermohaline circulation. So it's based on temperature and um, uh, haline meaning salt. So most water involved in deep ocean currents starts in the high latitudes, like the polar regions at the surface, because the water's cold at the surface already. And it acts kind of like a conveyor belt that as it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, you know, it moves to the Atlantic through the Pacific and everything and then back again it'll sink and come back around eventually. Let me show you an image of that. So here's what you can see and this is globally so it's not just one area that it's covering it's covering a whole bunch of them. So you can see out here in the Pacific I'm going to start on the right here this water kind of wells up here becomes warm through the equatorial regions and then comes all, all the way through here and then it gets to, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the North Atlantic and it sinks again. And then it becomes it's sort of this deep water subsurface flow and then a pattern repeats. Now you'll notice there's uh, this, this line across the bottom and that's sort of a circular pattern that's, that's only around the, the Antarctic here because some of that water just gets trapped, so to speak, around the polar regions because it just never warms up enough to get to the surface. So there's a lot going on here and this process is not fast by any means. That whole travel time, you're talking, you know, 40,000 miles. I mean, this takes thousands of years sometimes to, to occur, but it is occurring. It's just a very slow process. This is not something that's going to happen within a year or two. So let's take a look now at the shoreline where the ocean meets the shore. And we have what this, what is called the shoreline, which is the contact between land and sea. So where the, you know, roughly where the water meets the, uh, the land. You have the shore, which is the area between the lowest tidal level and the highest areas affected by storm waves. So it's sort of this wide area that, you know, the, at low, you don't see the area where the low tide is except for at low tide. The coastline is the seaward edge of the coast. And then the beach is the accumulation of all the sediment where we go and play in the summer, right? On the margin of the ocean. So let's take a look at that as an image. So we have everything offshore here from roughly here out to here is all offshore. So you have near shore, offshore, but it's still underwater. Then you have this sort of low, this dash line right here <clears throat> is the low tide shoreline. So when the tide is at its lowest, this is where the shore will be. And I remember the first time I ever actually saw that in Florida. I thought that was weird. You know, one day I went to the, 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 the beach and the beach was way out here. And the next time I went to the beach, it was way in. It's just weird. I had never experienced that before. So the shoreline here is right where the, the, the maximum, you know, pretty much where the, the ocean meets the land. Then you have sort of the maximum area of the high tide. And then everything up, up to here is you know all this area is considered you know the shore from everything from where the low tide is all the way through the the coastline then after that you get our dunes which are probably remnants of previous shores when maybe sea level was higher now energy traveling
across the ocean in the form of wind um, is going to create waves and it's derived from the sun. It all starts with the sun. The sun heats up the atmosphere. The atmosphere becomes unstable. That instability creates winds, and those winds blow across the ocean, creating waves. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have two parts of a wave. We have the crest, which is the high part, and then the trough, which is the low part. Now, the measurements of a wave are, there's a couple of different things here. We have the wave height, which is the difference between the tref, trough and a crest. The wavelength, which is the distance between two successive crests or troughs, and I'll show you an image of all this in a second. And then the wave period, which is the time interval for one wave to pass a fixed position. Now, my background is in earthquakes, so I deal with this this type of stuff all the time, uh, except in a much more mathematical manner, but we're not going to go into that. Okay, so let's take a look at a cartoon version of the wave. So the wind is moving and the wave is moving in this direction from left to right. You have the high point, which is a crest, and the low point, which is a trough. And the difference between those two is the wave height. So if somebody says, oh, man, let's go out there, there's eight-foot waves, you know, the different, that's the difference roughly between the, the bottom-most part of a wave and the top-most part of a wave. Now, the, the wavelength is the distance between the uh, uh, the trough or the crest, depending on where you're uh, 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 measuring. So actually, I should draw the line like this because it's in perspective. So that diff the, from the, the crest at point one to crest to point two, that's the wavelength. Now, most regular waves are, you know, maybe 30, 40 seconds or whatever minute wavelength. Whereas tsunamis, again, which we're not going to go into, but those can last, those, the time between each wave can be minutes, you know, 15 minutes sometimes. Those are really long period waves, we call those. Now, if you put a piece of, you know, a little particle in the water column and watched it as it went, you would notice that it's going to make these little circles here. The particle motion is circling like this and, and as the wave goes in that direction. But you'll also notice that these circles get smaller and smaller as you go down. So there is a point here, and that's what this, this line is here, that there's very little water movement below that point. And that's about half the length of the wave, half of the wavelength. So if the wavelength is uh, 30 feet, then if you go down 15 feet, that's roughly the maximum point you're going to feel any wave action. Below that, once you get low enough, you're not going to feel the waves. Now, wave height, length, and period depend on the wind speed. The higher the winds, the bigger the waves, right? And that's going to, you know, that that's going to play a role. Like during hurricanes, you get pretty big waves because the, the wind speeds are high. It also depends on the length of time the wind blows. Is it a short burst or is it a long gust? And then what we call fetch, which is the distance that the wind travels. There are parts of the world where there is very little to stop the wind from blowing, especially in the high latitudes in the southern hemisphere. And because of this, they can get massive storms with massive waves. These waves can get really big because there's nothing to stop the wind. There's no land to slow the wind down. What land typically slows wind down, even though it may not seem like it on a windy day, but there's a lot less in the way of inhibiting wind over the ocean than there is a wave. So there's parts of the oceans that can get very, very rocky because there's just nothing to stop it. So as the wave travels, water passes energy along by moving in a circle. Um, and at, like I mentioned in the last slide, about half the, at one half the length of, of the wavelength, the water particles become neg negligible. So if you're in sort of a surf zone and it's deep enough to where you can get deep, you know, down deep, there'll be a point where you won't feel those waves anymore. So as the waves approach a shore, there's a lot going on here. Like I mentioned in the previous slide, you have half the wavelength is where you start to not see any wave action. You could, you, you know, there's no particle motion in the water. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 
in deep water, you usually have waves with con constant wavelength. But what happens is when the shoreline starts to come up and feel the water, so to speak, as it approaches, it starts to touch the bottom. And what happens is that water, that the velocity of the wave decreases and the wave has nowhere to go but up. So what happens is the wave slows down and starts to curl over because it has nowhere else to go. It can't stack itself any higher. And that's why you have the surf zone here where the waves break. Now that could be caused by shoreline. It could be caused by a coral reef. It could be caused by anything. But the idea is, is once you get out of the deep water and the waves start to feel the, the effects of, of the ocean bottoms down here, it starts to drag on that wave and slow it down, and the wave has nowhere to go but to pile up on itself. This is especially important in tsunamis because those are very powerful, and that's where you can get waves that are like walls of water up to 100 feet high. Now, water is powerful. If you've ever been to the ocean and there's some pretty decent waves, you would know that if you're not standing in the right spot, that wave will take your swimsuit right off. <laughs> so, I mean, it, wave, wave action is super powerful. In fact, they're developing um, green energy that harnesses that power of the waves uh, using to turn like turbines to create electricity. So wave impact and pressure, it breaks down everything and that's what supplies sand to beaches. So the, the constant pulverizing of everything around it creates smaller and smaller pieces where you get the sand. Those smaller pieces create abrasion, which basically means they're all rubbing up against each other and they, it just breaks itself down to the point where you get down to things like sand grains or little rock fragments. And you'll also notice that a lot of those fragments are rounded, right? They're not jagged, otherwise it would hurt to walk on them. The reason being is because they've been just pulverized. All the rough edges have been sort of uh, shaved off and all you have left are sort of rounded um, grains. So beaches are composed of whatever material is available. So in Lake Michigan, there's a lot of pebbles. You know, we had a lot of glaciers here at one time. Um, there are, you know, white sand beaches where there's a lot of uh, former carbonate material, you know, sh animals with little shells. So you have white sand beaches, then you have black sand beaches, which is typically found in volcanic regions where the rocks in volcanic regions are usually very dark minerals, gabbros and things like that, and basalts, and they break down into black sand grains, black sand grains, excuse me, and that's why you have um, black sand beaches. Now, part of the shoreline process when the ocean is coming in is how that ocean wave hits the shore itself. And, you know, is it coming in straight on? Is it coming in on an angle? Sometimes the waves actually bend, and I'll show you that in a bit. And, you know, this creates a lot of interesting scenarios in terms of the types of erosion that takes place. If you have wave energy that's concentrated against the sides or the ends of a headland, or erosion on an irregular shoreline. And I'll show you examples of this um, as we go. As waves come into the shore, they come in parallel, sort of, but as they reach something like um, a point or something like that, they the wave refracts into that point, which causes more than average uh, erosion. And you can see that in this image. So this is actively being eroded here, and then everything around here is being deposited. You can see that on here too. So the shoreline is a little bit thinner here and it widens out way down here in the curve. Now, if you live right here, these houses right here are under constant battery of the ocean and that they may have to take some drastic steps to make sure that their houses are still there and, you know, after a big storm or something like that. So waves travel very similar to light, you know, where it'll refract around something and the idea is, is that it, the waves want to come in at a parallel angle to the shore. So another process that you can look at along a beach is what's called longshore transport. And in some areas, the prevailing winds come in at an angle different from that of the shore itself. 
So you have sort of these two processes. One's called beach drift, where the sediment moves in a zigzag pattern along the beach face. And you'll see that. You can see that in some images. Uh, I'll show you. And then you have longshore current, which is what we have right here in Lake Michigan. So that flows parallel to the shore and moves substantially more sediment than beach, uh, beach drift. Let me show you some examples of these. So here's longshore transport. So the, the, the longshore current is pretty much parallel to the, uh, the shore itself. And because of that, it takes, it takes the particles and moves them up and down like this. So for every wave, it's moving them in and out, but it's always moving it in this direction. Now that occurs because um, incoming waves and sand at an angle up the beach while the water is carrying it directly down slope of the beach. Now here in, um, in Lake Michigan, it's not that pronounced. But it's definitely there is longshore. You can see this is this bottom image is similar to what's happening in Lake Michigan, where you have sort of an angle. There are two different angles here for the beach and for the uh, the shore. So it is it moves things, but it's not as um, extreme as the upper image there. You also have what are called rip currents. Now these are dangerous to swimmers, especially and. Um, we have these right down at Lake Michigan as well. That's where you have concentrated movements of water flowing in the opposite direction of breaking waves. So in a nutshell, what happens is, is the waves are coming in, but for whatever reason, usually due to topographic differences on the shore, you have this that particular area of water, which you can see in the image here, flowing out. And if you get caught in one of those as a swimmer, it literally drags you offshore. So if you're not a good swimmer, you get caught in one of those, you're in big trouble. Now, there's different kinds of erosional features that the ocean uh, creates. And some of these are spectacular, and they're, they're the reason people like to live by the ocean. You have things like wave-cut cliffs and wave-cut platforms, marine terraces, and um, the beautiful sea arches and sea stacks, which I'll show you images of all of these. So here's a wave cut platform. So obviously this this uh, rock down here in, on the bottom here is very resistant to erosion because it's still there even though it's under the ocean for the most part. And then you have the marine terrace up here. So a lot of times that could be from tectonic processes, that could be from uh, um, sea level changes, things like that. But that's where these are coming from. You also have erosional features such as the sea arch and the sea stack, which, you know, obviously these are beautiful, <laughs> but this is all from wave, you know, wave action. You know, at one time, all of these rocks were probably one continuous piece. And just from the battering of millions of years of the ocean, it just, you know, it beats the heck out of them and creates these beautiful sea arches with a window through them. And you see these in images off the coast of California. I'd love to see these. I've never actually seen them in person, but I would love to see those. You have deposition, in, in addition to erosional features like we just saw, you also have depositional features where areas of concentrated sediment are being deposited based on the types of currents that take place in that area. One thing is called a spit, which is a ridge of sand extending out from the land in, um, into the mouth of the adjacent bay. Um, and then you have the bay mouth bar, which is a sandbar that completely crosses a bay. And a tombolo, which is a ridge of sand that connects an island to the mainland. And I'll show you some examples of these. So here is a bay, mar bay mouth bar, which is essentially, like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a small beach thin strip of uh, sand just offshore of the main land. And then you have a spit, which is this thing extending out into the ocean here. And that, that is all due to the, the set, the prevailing sediment is going in this direction. So it's carrying all the sediment in that direction. And it keeps curving and curving. And it builds the spit over many, many thousands of years. Now, this is where you get barrier islands from, like the Outer Banks in North Carolina, which I've been to twice, and it's absolutely gorgeous. A lot of fun to be out there. 
So they're mainly along the Atlantic and uh, Gulf coastal plains. They're parallel to the coast, and they originate in several different ways. But uh, man, they're fun. It's, it's, if you ever get a chance, go to the Outer Banks. It's pretty cool. So here's the Barrier Islands. <clears throat> Again, this is uh, off the coast of North Carolina. So these are the Outer Banks, essentially. And you can see that there's this thin, it's fairly thin in spots. It gets thicker in other areas, but in this particular area, it's very thin. It's just a thin strip of sand that's separating the ocean from the sort of a tidal pool kind of thing on the inside. So shoreline erosion is influenced by many factors. You have the proximity to sediment laden rivers. So if you've got a river that's full of sediment, that's just pumping it into an area, it's giving that area more sediment to work with in terms of where it's going to dis, uh, deposit it later on. You have the, if there's any tectonic activity, either raising or lowering things, shifting things around. Uh, the topography and composition of the land, is it low and flat or is it high, hilly and you know with higher slopes? You have the prevailing wind and weather patterns. Are they blowing inshore, offshore? It all, that'll all play a role in how the shoreline erosion is, uh, in, what it's influenced by. And then the configuration of the coastline. Are there natural bays, are there the natural estuaries, things like that, or is it just straight? So all of these play a role as to how quickly or slowly a shoreline is going to be um, eroded away because it's always being deposited on and eroded away at the same time because man likes to live near the ocean and the ocean's power is really strong in terms of deposition and erosion based on the wave action you know how do we stabilize that that shoreline in order to be able to live there without the threat of our house being eroded away by the ocean. And there's several different things, things like groins, which are little barriers built at a right angle to the beach that are designed to trap sand. And I'll show you an example of those. Breakwaters, which we have one right here in, in uh, right off the coast shore of uh, Milwaukee here. Um, what that does is that protects, like build sort of an inland harbor to protect the, the breaking waves from coming in and you know damaging boats and things like that. Then you have sea walls, which are you know reinforced walls made by man against breaking waves, especially in areas that are subject to a lot of storm action. Unfortunately, uh, not sometimes these are not very effective because again, the the ocean has so much power. Yeah, uh, even a small wave carries with it tremendous amount of uh, erosional and depositional power with it. So here's an example of some jetties. Now the, these stick out into the ocean and the current is going in this direction. And what happens is you get all the sand build up in here. And sometimes what happens is you can get too much and it'll actually curl around the jetty itself and close this off. So they usually have to, um, they have to uh, dredge those out quite a bit because there's always sand going in there. Here's some example of some groins. These are just like little little walls that jut out into the ocean. And you can see in between each one, you have sort of this pile of sand. So the, the waves are coming in. Let me get erase that real quick. The waves are coming in sort of at this angle. So everything's being carried in this direction, so to speak. So when the waves come in here, the tr you know it, they get trapped in here. Or in here and you can see each one of these has a bunch of sand in it so that's what those are for is to help collect the sand to keep otherwise what would happen is if you didn't have these all of that wave action would be slamming against the shore over here and that's not good either if you live right there then you have a seawall which is just that it's a huge wall designed to buffer you know, then the ocean's wrath against whoever might be living along it. Um, and, you know, sometimes these are effective and sometimes they're not, depending on the strength of any given storm.
really the only two uh, options for uh, responding to erosion problems are beach nourishment, which is adding sand to the beach system. So as it gets eroded away, you artificially add beach to it to keep it at that sort of level. And relocating buildings away from a beach, obviously, because the beach is unstable. The ocean never stops. It just, it never stops. And these, these problems are different depending on which coast you're dealing with. On the East Coast, they have different problems with the West Coast, just based on, you know, um, geology, tectonics, and, you know, ocean uh, currents and things like that, prevailing winds. So here's an example of beach nourishment where you might have a dredge out in the ocean that 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 boat out there is a dredge and it's sucking up sand and then they pump it into this area now last time i was in north carolina uh we were kind of bummed out because the beach right next to our hotel the entire time we were there this is what they were doing we had to move down the beach a ways in order to actually go swimming so i actually got to watch this it's pretty crazy those are some serious pumps right there but they, they do this all the time in the Outer Banks because the Outer Banks take the brunt punishment of the ocean um, being right there. So I got to actually see this being done. It's pretty interesting. So like I mentioned along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast, there, there are a lot of development along the barrier islands. They receive the full force of storms and that's why they have to replenish the beaches every once in a while. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of development there. If you've ever been to the Outer Banks, there's hotels and you know uh, houses and you know everything right along the beach, all the way up and down there. And the the problem is is you know they've been built faster than they could secure the beach itself. So that that's always going to be a problem. It's kind of like the Mississippi River; it never stops. They're just always trying to stay at least slightly ahead of it. Along the Pacific coast, you have narrow beaches backed by steep mountain cliffs. And that's that's because you're at sort of the edge of a tectonic boundary. Um, and then the beaches are narrow, a lot of them, because of there, it's there's a lot of dams and reservoirs that aren't carrying the sediment all the way to the ocean. It's being diverted. So therefore, you have a lot of rapid erosion along the beaches. So this is sort of the opposite issue where they've taken so much out of the system that there's nothing left by the time it gets to the beach. Okay, so let's switch our attention now over to tides. Now, tides are changes in elevation of, of the ocean surface. It's caused by gravitational forces by on upon the earth by the moon and a little bit by the sun. Now, before I go any further, um, being that my background is in earthquakes and seismology, when I hear the people use the term tidal wave, I, I cringe. A tidal wave is nothing to do with the tides. It's called a tsunami, which is a Japanese word for harbor wave. So if you're talking about something that was generated by a very large earthquake, that is a tsunami. It is not a tidal wave. It has nothing to do with a tidal wave. But unfortunately, that term is stuck. Um, but for us you know, who deal with earthquakes, it's kind of annoying. But all right, there I'm off my soapbox now. <laughs> All right, so the Earth is spinning, and because it's spinning, and then we also spin around other planetary bodies, we have the moon spinning around us, and we spin around the sun. We have areas that have bulges and other areas that have sort of low areas, and you can see that on this image. So there are parts here that have much higher bulge than others and that's why some areas get very high and low tides very dramatic and the others that don't now if you don't know this uh that, what is it the uh, bay of fundy i think it's called uh off of this coast of nova scotia gets some of the biggest tides in the world it's crazy it's like 20 or 30 feet that's where you see the boats literally sitting on the ground because the, all the water's gone it's very dramatic <laughs> Um, but the idea is that you have a spinning body of uh, mostly water, which is Earth, and you have the, the moon kind of sucking via gravitational force the, the water toward it when the, when the Earth is toward it. So 
you know, you're going to get higher tides in the summer or the, their, uh, our winter months or the lower hemisphere summer, summer months. And then when it's tilted the other way, you're going to get higher tides in our summer months or their winter months because we're tilted towards the sun and the, you know, the moon too. So you get the spring tide, which is during new and full moons. The gravitational forces are added together. You, you get those especially high and low tides. Again, that's because that's where we're at our most extreme, um, either away or from uh, the planetary body. So spring tide is when the moon is a full or new position. The tidal bulges are created that that along with the the sun as well you sort of have this cumulative effect where you get the highest and or lowest tides available so to speak because they're kind of all in a row that way now the neap tide is the opposite of that which is the first and third quarters of the moon the gravitational forces offset and you get sort of the smallest tides um, of the of that particular month so here's neap tide if we have the sun over here you have the earth and moon kind of out of phase so you don't get very much tide because the the center of the earth is uh, not all lined up the way it's supposed to be like it would be for the spring tide Now there's different factors that influence the tides. Things like shape of the coastline, the configuration of the ocean basin, and then water depth. So you have two main types of patterns. You have the diurnal pattern, which is a single high and a single low point um, during the course of the day. And that usually occurs along the northern shore of the Gulf of Mexico. I've actually seen this a little bit um, in, in Florida. Then you have the semi-diurnal tidal pattern, which is two high and two low tides each day. Um, little difference in the high and low water heights, which is common in the Atlantic coast of the United States. So it, again, it all depends on where you are. It, when you get up to Nova Scotia area, that, that's sort of the sweet spot. They get some of the biggest tides in the world, along with some areas over in like England and Scotland, where you can walk way out into the ocean before the tide comes back in. Just don't get caught doing it. <laughs> in fact, people have died doing that. They tell people not to go out there anymore. Then you have sort of a mixed tidal pattern um, where you have too high and too low, but they're not necessarily the same high and low, which is typical along the Pacific coast of the United States. So here's some graphs of that. And you can see, um, some different values here and so these this is where i've been taught the bay of fundy up here way up in nova scotia gets some of the biggest tides in the world they have the biggest high you know swing from high to low tides now tidal currents are exactly that these are currents not tidal waves <laughs> um where you have the water when it comes in or out, depending on whether it's low tide or high tide. And those forces can be strong for a human, but in the grand, it's not a tsunami. Remember that, it's not a tsunami. And you can get what's called a flood current or an ebb current, depending on is it coming in or going out for the tide. Um, and that's always fun to watch. You know, I mean, you get to see, if you ever get to see that, I don't think I've ever seen it, it really great. I've, I've seen it in a slow version down in Florida, but you know, I would love to actually just sit up in Nova Scotia and watch all the water drain out of the Bay of Fundy. That would be pretty cool. What happens sometimes is you get a pattern of tides where when it comes in, it floods or what we call a flood delta where the water kind of swooshes in and with it uh, carries all that sediment and that sediment then falls out in the form of a delta within here and then the water comes back out during an ebb tide but not necessarily as strong as the flood tide which is the tide coming in and this repeated pattern can cause these tidal deltas 
um, in be sometimes in between a barrier island or these tidal flats. So this water out here, this lagoon water, is very still compared to everything out here. There's no waves or anything. So once that water comes in, the sediment has a chance to just sort of filter down because it does go back out eventually, but just not as fast. Okay, so there's lots going on in this chapter, and I know this was pretty quick, but I wanted to, you know, I had to get this done. I'm a little behind on things. I hope you enjoyed this chapter. There, you know, the ocean never ceases to amaze, and waves are super powerful. Like I said, they they, they dictate everything that occurs anywhere near them. So the shorelines and the energy and everything that goes on when there's storms or hurricanes, the ocean is a massive amount of, has a massive amount of energy to both erode and deposit, depending on which um, type of, uh, which end you're on, so to speak. In areas where there's a lot of erosion taking place, you have to be careful because, you know, if you live in that area and you see this every once in a while, depending on what it is, all of a sudden a house will fall into the ocean because the cliff that it was sitting on got eroded away by the ocean. The ocean never stops. It just keeps going and keeps going. The other part of that is that you have, uh, sometimes you'll have a tremendous amount of deposition. And what ha you've also seen is people who had oceanfront property within a couple of years, maybe 10 years, all of a sudden now their oceanfront property is sitting 50 feet off the front of their door because there's been so much beach added because of things that happen. They, they hate that because they used to have the ocean right at their doorstep and now it's way out there because all the sand has been deposited. All of these things occur. You know, and then you have the tides, that super high tides. Go look up the Bay of Fundy tide in Nova Scotia. It's just pretty cool. It's really interesting. Um, it, and then there's an area, I believe in England, where, you know, they used to, people will run out there and like collect shells or whatever. The problem is, is if you don't get back in time, you're probably going to die. And many people have. So they put up signs and try to stop people from going out there. Or I think they have some kind of, kind of alarm system to give them like a 10-minute head start to make sure they get back in time. Because you, you don't want to get caught out there. Because the, 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 the tide goes out so far that if that water were to come back in and it comes back in in a hurry, you're stuck offshore, far offshore. <laughs> it's a huge tide roughly at the same latitude as the Bay of Fundy. So go look those things up. They're very, very interesting, interesting to watch. Um, and there's usually time-lapse photography type stuff for that. It's really cool. So I hope you enjoyed this chapter and take care.